Uh, so yeah, I want to talk to you about algorithmic optimization, but first uh, a few words about how I got to this point. Uh, I created a library called Leaflet for interactive maps nine years ago, and in a year since, uh, it became so mainstream that you can see it everywhere on the internet when there are map maps. And actually, sometimes I see it in Hollywood movies. Like, this is a real scene from The Equalizer, uh, where Denzel Washington stares angrily at my open source library. <laughs> that was really cool to see. Uh, anyway. <laughs> So uh, for the last six years uh, at Mapbox, I've been a part of a team with a much more ambitious goal of uh, taking uh, cartographic technology and bringing it directly into the browser, where instead of loading just uh, map images, uh, you uh, load raw data, like roads and buildings and rivers and parks, and processing that data on the fly, on the client, and rendering it at 60 frames per second which is a very difficult job. Uh, so, of course, we had to use all the recent technologies like WebGL, web workers, etc., and some sophisticated algorithms. Uh, and it also required an intense focus on performance. Some people think of performance as something that makes a difference in how long the user waits uh, for something to happen after clicking on a button. But in many cases, performance actually makes a difference between something that was never possible before, and now you can actually use it in a browser and feels like magic. Uh, so um, yeah, in, in this case of uh, vector rendering, it was either we, uh, we had to make the frame rate stable, so uh, have making it as fast as possible, or the map wouldn't be usable at all. So I learned quite a few tricks of how to write extremely fast code in, in the last years. And uh, in uh, any occasion where I could uh, extract this code that I wrote into a standalone library, I did so. So um, I released uh, a few dozen libraries. Most of them are very small and focused on very specific one task, like an algorithm or a data structure. And uh, to give you a few examples, this is the world's fastest library for breaking down a polygon into triangles, which is important for WebGL rendering. Uh, then there's the fastest library for generating a sprite layout. Uh, I wrote six different libraries for spatial indexing, which allows uh, searching geometric data really fast. Uh, the fastest library for visual regression testing. Uh, and this is my latest. Uh, this is uh, uh, approximation of terrains with triangular meshes. Um, but, uh, and when you work on this kind of stuff, you sometimes get very competitive. You want your library to be uh, faster than all the others. And sometimes it can get really ridiculous. Uh, my favorite example of that is uh, Delaunay triangulation. So Delaunay triangulation as, and a similar concept uh, Voronoi diagram is uh, uh, a fundamental algorithm in computational geometry, which is extremely useful for data visualization. And um, let's take a look at a sample of uh, running Delaunay triangulation on 1 million points in JavaScript. 1 million is quite a big amount for JavaScript, right? Even by today's standards. So um, in the beginning, there was a library called simply Delaunay. You can find it in NPM. And it performed this task in 2 minutes, 30 seconds. Some, someone thought that, huh, this is not fast enough for my needs, so I, I can write something faster. And they made a library called Delaunay Fast. <laughs> And it was indeed much faster. But someone else came, tried using it, and thought, hmm, this is called fast, but it's not actually fast. I need it faster. So can you guess what the library name? Faster Delaunay. <laughs> and it was a huge uh, groundbreaking change, because it was like 20 to 30 times faster, uh, which is huge. Uh, but it was too, 
too fun for me to pass on such an opportunity, and I tried writing my own library for this. Uh, and I, I was tempted to call it the fastest donor, <laughs> but I would embarrass myself because someone else will come after me and write something faster. So um, I called it Donator. It's five times faster than the previous one. And uh, the interesting thing about it is that uh, the community tried porting it to C++. And it's uh, just a little bit faster than the JavaScript version. Then uh, I got interested in Rust. And as a learning project, I tried porting this algorithm to Rust. And it was also just a little bit faster. So the point here is that if you write your JavaScript very carefully with uh, like algorithmic thinking in mind, it can approach native uh, speeds. Uh, so um, you might think that uh, you need a kind of a computer science degree to work on that kind of stuff. But the <laughs> um, fact is uh, that uh, by the time I uh, dropped out of university, I still knew nothing about algorithms and data structures. I had to learn this from scratch, and so can you. This is my student time. This is actually me. 15 years ago in a low-budget gothic metal music video. <laughs> That's the type of stuff I did back then and sometimes do today, too. So um, how to make fast code? You Three steps, very simple. Find a bottleneck, something that's uh, actually the, the slowest part, and try to understand why it's slow, and then make it faster. Uh, <laughs> uh, OK, I'm done. Um, so uh, the easiest uh, step is uh, finding a bottleneck, because modern tooling for profiling is amazing. It's so much easier to uh, find out what is slow in your application that, than even like two years ago it wasn't as awesome as it is now. The tools are great. You just like record uh, something that's slow with, uh, for example, Chrome DevTools profiler, and then you drill down through the code, and, you, and then you find a function that's uh, taking all the time, taking much time, more time than needed. And then you open it up in your editor, and you stare at it for hours <laughs> and don't know what to do. So those two steps, understand why it's slow and make it faster, this has a lot to do about algorithms. And I'll try to make a gentle introduction. Uh, and the most important definition to make about slow code and optimization is that slow code is code that does unnecessary work. It's a code that does more than you need for a particular task. So our job as someone who optimizes code is to find useless crap and remove it. Uh, so we'll jump into a practical example. Uh, Rollup is one of my favorite open source projects. I use it in all my libraries. And it's an amazing JavaScript bundler that's used by pretty much all library authors, like in React, Babel, uh, stencil, you name it. So um, I used it a lot and wanted it to be faster. Um, and at some point, I started looking into optimizing it and found out that uh, one of the slowest parts was generating source maps. Uh, so I n profiled it and narrowed it down to uh, two lines of code. One line of code used, its, used a dependency called magic string to generate a source map. Um, then the second uh, line decoded this string into an object to manipulate later. And source maps look like this. this they look like a string. So uh, you can't really understand why it's slow, uh, because there's a dependency, and you have to look inside and figure out what's going on. So I looked in, into it. And what magic string actually did, it did some magic, generated a source map in a, as a JSON object, and then it encoded it into this uh, special string representation. Then on the roll-up side, we took the string, uh, and we decoded it into a JSON to manipulate later. And at this point, when the code is presented like this, you immediately can notice what's wrong with this code, right? So these two lines of code. They're absolutely useless. You take 
some data, convert it into a different format, and then you immediately convert it back, and you never needed that other format in the first place. So uh, it's very hard to notice this kind of uh, problems uh, when those lines of code are in different functions, but when they are in different files, it's even harder. When they are in different projects altogether, it's super difficult. So uh, when you optimize code, you always need to be aware of uh, like what happens in your dependencies. Uh, so um, after removing those two lines of code, it got source map generation got 40% 40 40 faster in rollup. Uh, now, to understand more complex use cases of optimization, you need to learn the concept of algorithmic complexity, which is a measure of how performance scales with input size. And uh, you probably know what all those things mean, but we'll just assume that you know nothing about it, and I'll try to reintroduce you to it from scratch. So the first category of algorithmic complexity is called constant complexity, O1. It's when, regardless of how big your data input is, you have to perform a constant number of operations. And this is the best category because you don't have to worry about it at all. Usually, the bottleneck isn't there. You don't have to deal with it. It's just fast. Then there's the next category, linear complexity, ON. And you can easily spot it if there's a loop in your code. Uh, and this category, we'll call it suspicious. Because linear complexity can easily uh, grow into much slower uh, complexities. And I'll show you how. So the next uh, category is uh, O and squared, which or so-called quadratic complexity. Uh, you can spot it, for example, when you have nested for loops. And this complexity means your code is ridiculously slow. Um, and this is a sign that you can optimize it a lot. Usually, but by this point, this is slow code. And uh, it's easy to spot it when you, you see just like two loops together, but sometimes it's not obvious at all. Like you see one loop, you think this is linear, then it turns out that uh, a native browser method, index off, is, is also linear complexity. And when nested, the, they become the quadratic complexity. And this is slow. And uh, many people don't even think about the uh, performance of native methods. They just assume that everyone optimized them maximally, and they are just fast. But if you're not aware of the complexity, it can grow into really, really slow code. And sometimes it's not obvious because uh, uh, those complexities are in different methods or in different dependencies, et cetera. So, and uh, it's such a common problem that there's even a separate blog, blog about it called Accidentally Quadratic. It's a serious engineering blog that uh, looks into problems uh, with performance in really big projects like Elasticsearch, React, et cetera. So this is a very common problem and very easy to hit. Then if you have n cubed, three nested loops, you just throw it out. You, it's beyond saving. So we'll look into uh, another practical example. And I forgot to mention that every time you see this, uh, like the name of the repository and the number, this is a pull request. You can look up and see what actually happened. So this was a uh, code in D3 library that was slow. And you don't have to like read and understand what's happening. So, and I didn't understand what happens here too. I just, I noticed one loop. Uh huh. This is suspicious. So I looked further and I noticed another loop inside, and that's already very slow. <laughs> and then I looked further and I noticed splice, which is also a linear complexity operation, and that means you throw it out and you write it from scratch. And that's what I did, and it became many times faster. So uh, you have to be suspicious anytime you use uh, native array methods, because they are linear complexity. All the index of includes splice, et cetera. Uh, but so far, I've talked about computational complexity, but there's also another aspect to performance, which is uh, memory complexity. And uh, if we say about slow code as uh, code that does unnecessary work. In terms of memory, it means you allocate much more memory than you need. And this is 
also a problem. So every time you use things like slice, concat, map, and filter, or string split, you allocate new arrays, new memory, and sometimes you don't need that. And getting rid of that makes code faster. So this kind of style of uh, programming that usually is called like functional style programming by some, uh, if it's in a, in a hot path and you need to squeeze the last bit of performance out of it, you, you, you have to avoid it because in this case, you allocate memory and throw it out immediately four times. And this is just like, it's an S3 work. Um, and even in small cases, like uh, JavaScript doesn't have a way to return multiple values. So what you usually do if, is you define an array, return that, and if you immediately destructure the values and don't need this as an array, you just performed an unnecessary work uh, because you didn't need this, needed this array. So in hard paths, you have to be mindful of those kinds of things like, like this. So another practical example, I really love source maps, so this is also about source maps. Uh, this is a dependency of rollup2 that performed decoding of, of the string into a uh, source map. So what it did before is it split the string into an uh, array of strings, each representing a line. That for each line, it sp split the line into an array of segments. Then for each segment, it decoded it into an array of coin points and did something about it. Now we know that if we have three nested loops, we need to rewrite this from scratch. So um, the pull request made it so that we process decoding in a streaming fashion. We go character by character and do something depending on which character we encounter it. And this doesn't need any allocation at all. And this made is just one loop, no location, and it's three times faster. So I haven't talked about logarithmic complexity yet, but it's the best complexity. Uh, and you will understand why, because, uh, well, intuitively, when you think about this range of complexities from constant to linear, you think about logarithmic as, as something in the middle, but actually, it's somewhere here. It means it's blazing fast. Um, so if you have an array of million points, uh, logarithmic operation will take 20 operations. It's very fast. So the, the classic example of that is binary search. And uh, usually, like, you never think about it. It's, it's just something that you get asked on code interviews and then never use in practice. But once you actually try to understand how, how to use it, uh, it kind of clicks in your head. And then you can start seeing it everywhere. Uh, so binary ser search is really easy to explain. So if you have sorted sorted array uh, and you need to find something inside, you just, at every point, you throw out half of the items. So uh, we'll look at the middle. The, the item that we want to find is in the left half. We threw it out. So at each point, we throw out half of the items and we find our item very fast. So this is another pull request to roll up uh, where a particular build was taking ma many minutes uh, with source maps and just a few seconds without source maps. So rewriting uh, a particular uh, code to use binary search uh, made it 40 times faster. So algorithmic optimization, uh, when you optimize code, you try to reduce the the complexity, but how do you actually do that? Um, the way I like to think about it is that you have some very slow operation and you repeat it several times. Uh, the way to make it fast and reduce algorithmic complexity is to organize data in some way uh, that allows you to perform all the subsequent operations much faster. So do more in the beginning to do less every next time. Uh, and to organize data, you have all kinds of data structures, uh, but it doesn't have to be complicated. Actually, my favorite data structure is just a sorted array. It, it also organizes your data in a certain way, and you, you can operate on it much faster. 
if you know, know what, what you're doing. So for example, one of my libraries, Katie Bush, for searching geometric points, is just a fancily sorted array where when you sort, taking turns by horizontally or vertically, and it allows searching the points instantly, even though it's just an array which was sorted. And the last point I want to make is that sometimes it's not enough to be mindful of what happens in your dependencies. Uh, sometimes you need to think about what happens on the JavaScript engine level. So you have two objects here, and they look the same, so you think that they are represented in the same way in the engine. But one starts with one in the key, one, two, three, and it's a hash table. If it starts with one, it thinks that it's a generic keys, and the other one starts with zero, and it's, uh, it's, it's not different from an array. It's pretty much the same thing. So it gets represented the same way. So there's a, a test coverage uh, utility uh, named Nick New York, uh, which was previously Istanbul project. And uh, this test coverage uh, instrumentation was taking a l very long time, like many, many minutes. We wanted to optimize that. To, to generate this test coverage information, there, there's a st stats object that keeps track of uh, uh, which line of code got executed, and it keeps track of this in an object with uh, keys like one is uh, for the line, the first line, two is for the second line, etc. And simply changing this indexing from uh, to, to to start with zero, it made test coverage 15 times faster. And it, this was mind blowing to me because this is a project that was used by the community for years, and like no one had an idea that it could be made 15 times faster by just changing one, one line of code. So the point is that people take established code for granted, but there are lots of opportunities for optimization, and you can always find some room for, for improvement. So I encourage you to learn how things work under the hood. Don't be afraid to reinvent the wheel. Simplify your code constantly uh, because it's easier to optimize. And practice optimization, and you'll learn how to write fast code by default. OK, thank you.